Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the QT Faculty of Law, to our symposium on copyright law and the creative industries. Uh, the purpose of this event is to bring together creative practitioners, uh, cultural, institutional representatives, and uh, legal academics and lawyers uh, to discuss the intersection between copyright law, creativity, and culture. As is always the case at QT, um, in keeping with the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where QT now stands and recognise that these have always been places of teaching and learning. We wish to pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play within the QT community. Uh, Elliot uh, Bledslow is going to talk about creativity, culture, copyright and COVID-19. Elliot is a, a copyright officer with the Australian Digital Alliance and the Australian Libraries uh, Copyright Committee. Um, he's been very active in the community arts and a range of different cultural sectors and even once upon a time used to uh, work at QUT in a previous capacity. Um, he's been very interested in how the coronavirus crisis has impacted the creative industries and has also kind of raised uh, a whole host of novel issues in relation to copyright law, policy and practice. Elliot. Thank you. Hello, I'm Elliot Bledsoe and I'm the Copyright Officer with the Australian Digital Alliance and the Australian Libraries Copyright Committee. Today I'm going to talk about some of the copyright issues for creators and cultural institutions which have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Much of the content that I'm going to present today draws on some recent submissions by the ADA and the ALCC related to the pandemic and its impact on the arts and the glam sectors. Before I get started, I'd like to recognise that I'm presenting today on Turrbal and Yagara country, uh, and I'd like to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as Australia's first peoples and traditional custodians of the land. I and the ADA pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people viewing this presentation and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities and their cultures throughout Australia. Copyright is a legal protection designed to encourage the sharing of knowledge, ideas and culture. It is important to recognise and respect that Indigenous peoples the world over have been sharing knowledge through networks for hundreds of thousands of years. Australia has a long history of storytelling that starts with our first peoples. Also, before I get into the content, you can reuse this presentation in any way that you like because it's available for reuse under the terms of a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license, which means that you're free to copy and redistribute it or any modifi modified version of it that you make as long as you acknowledge the Australian Digital Alliance as the copyright owner. Okay. Let's get started. For artists, producers and venues, COVID-19 has disrupted how artistic works are created and presented. The pandemic has been an exceptionally disruptive process, an interruptive process for uh, creators of all kinds, uh, regardless of what area or art form they're practicing in, regardless of the type of cultural body that they are, COVID-19 has had a significant impact on the creative practice and the operation of these types of organisations. So the sites of arts and culture, theatres, cinemas, art galleries, concert halls, music venues, libraries, museums and other cultural venues are all built on an assumption of physical access. Uh, for artists, while the creative process may often be uh, a fairly solitary one occurring in the background, the presentation of artwork often happens in a physical location, uh, such as some of the sites that I've mentioned. And similarly, cultural organisations uh, make available their collections and the activities that they engage in through these types of physical locations. So there's a very strong assumption of physical access, which has been uh, not particularly cons consistent or uh, hasn't been able to play very well with the COVID-19 lockdown requirements. So in the period of about two weeks, starting from early March 2020, Australia's arts and cultural venues closed their doors and arts events were cancelled or postponed in response to the pandemic. 
the, the number of arts and cultural events that have been uh, cancelled or postponed and the number of venues that have been closed is quite astronomical. The impact is actually hard to quantify, let alone hard to fathom. Uh, so, for example, I lost my gig, uh, which is a data collection project that's been run by the Australian Festivals Association and the Australian Music Industry Network, asked artists, artists, managers, production and technician crews, venues and event operators, and others involved in festivals and music events to list the incomes and jobs that they've lost as a result of COVID-19. So as of 27th of April, which is the last tally that they uh, published, they estimated $340 million worth of uh, lost incomes and impacted events. Another tally of the devastation to the arts and cultural sector is the Impossible Project. This documents arts and cultural events and projects that have been disrupted, reorientated, or obliterated by the pandemic. As you can see from the website, which is a growing list of uh, these types of events, experiences, music and live performance events, uh, there's a, a significant number of things that have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The arts and cultural sectors are resilient though. We have seen many creative and innovative responses as creators and cultural institutions have pivoted to online delivery. There's literally thousands of examples of artists and cultural institutions from all over the world who have been looking at different ways of exploring how to present and deliver their work to online audiences. Um, a few closer to home include Opera Queensland's An Aria A Day. This saw a release of a new aria every day at 6 p.m. through the Opera Queensland's website, YouTube channels, and other social media accounts. Sunshine Coast-based arts organisation Feral Arts hosted a weekly, daily, 30-minute little lunch uh, to present work and provide an online space for the arts to stay connected and talk about the issues affecting their sector. So this event series ran every weekday for half an hour, uh, identified at a time slot that could accommodate multiple time zones across the country and showed uh, different types of work, uh, theatre, music, dance, as well as a number of conversations about uh, issues affecting the arts. In particular, it identified a number of key themes uh, that have been, I guess, exacerbated by the COVID-19 scenarios, such as um, access for people with disability needs, uh, as well as uh, different types of representation of minority communities and minority artists. And Craig Goma here in Brisbane developed a range of activities under the banner Home with Goma. These included uh, draw-along workshops, time-lapse videos of artworks in situ, uh, other activities such as a virtual book club, behind-the-scenes videos of art preservation processes, a children's art podcast, and even yoga instruction inside the gallery. Of course, there were literally thousands of examples of how arts organisations have responded. Uh, everything from the major international well-recognised institutions such as the Tate uh, and the Metropolitan Opera uh, to smaller localised organisations working for and with uh, their local communities. COVID-19 accelerated the pace of digital transformation in the way that Australian communities wish to engage with co creative and cultural works including cultural institutions and libraries. So taking the State Library of Western Australia as an example, uh, they saw monthly membership applications increase by more than 100% uh, in the period immediately following the closure of the venue. Uh, and they saw online and phone inquiries increase by 50% on pre-pandemic numbers. So the extreme uh, or skyrocketing demand for online access to creative and cultural services uh, has been well documented across a number of institutions. Closures and cancellations prompted many artists and cultural organisations to provide access to creative works and content online. Zoom conferences and YouTube live streams quickly replaced theatres and concert halls, 
online collection catalogues replaced in-person visits to galleries and museums, and more users sought out ebooks and other digital resources made available through libraries. But of course, online delivery makes things more complicated in terms of copyright. There are significant barriers that creators and cultural institutions face when trying to provide online access to creative works as a result of outdated copyright laws. Uh, in particular, in the arts sector more so than the cultural sector, artists often actually don't have a particularly well-developed copyright literacy, so they may not even be aware of the difference between uh, presenting work in a physical environment, uh, such as a theatre, as opposed to presenting or communicating work online, uh, and that there are significantly different copyright parameters depending on the type of delivery method that you're using. Increased reliance on digital technologies to connect with audiences during the COVID-19 pandemic further exposed some of the limitations in the copyright system. Uh, one area where issues arise relates to provisions of the Copyright Act designed to apply to hard copy materials, but that don't apply when those same materials are digitised. The often cited example here is the lending of a book. So no infringement occurs when you loan a hard copy of a book to a friend or a loved one, but loaning the same book using digital technologies is likely an infringement. The likelihood of most artists knowing these kinds of differences or nuances between the physical and the online uh, environment is pretty low. Now, of course, the online environment becomes complicated because every digital use involves copying and communication. And by default, permission is required to do these things, unless, of course, an exception exists. But of course, even if there is an exception, these need to be drafted so that they are technology neutral to avoid situations like the format shifting exception for films that permits the copying of films in analog formats, such as VHS, uh, VHS cassettes uh, being, uh, being copied onto a computer for personal use, but digital formats like DVDs and Blu-rays are currently not within the scope of that exception. Uh, of course, the reality is that the types of delivery methods for cinematographic film have moved well beyond both uh, VHS cassettes and DVDs and Blu-rays, and people predominantly look to streaming services to access these content, uh, yet the Copyright Act is somewhere around the 1980s in terms of thinking about these kinds of issues. Uh, in the educational context, including images, video clips, and quotes as part of a class or lecture is okay within the confines of the classroom, but that's not the case when a teacher is using a platform such as Zoom to deliver educational content. In those kinds of situations, permission is typically needed for all of the content that's included in those slides. Creators seeking to provide online offerings whilst complying with copyright law must accept some absurd compromises. So we talked a little bit before about the Arts Front uh, Little Lunch Online events. In that situation, they had a dancer performing to music and the video was uh, automatically taken down by YouTube only a couple of minutes after the end of the live streaming, uh, which led to a situation where when dancers were included in the program after that, they had to essentially agree to not stream the music through the video in order to overcome these kinds of barriers. So you have dancers performing to a set of music that can't be communicated to the audience online because of the nature of both copyright and the kind of automated or, or machine-based uh, copyright clearance processes that attach to that. Um, this, uh, this is an actual real example, as I said. Uh, the dancer, in some of these cases, opted not to include the music in the live stream to avoid having the video taken down by YouTube's automated content moderation systems. During the pandemic, the risk of automated takedown was even greater as YouTube relied more on machine learning to remove content without human review. YouTube themselves warned on their blog that users and creators may see increased video removals, including some videos that may not violate policies. So there was an open acknowledgement by the platforms that it was likely that machine-based content review would result in content being taken down that wasn't in infringement of copyright. Similarly, Facebook and Twitter also ramped up their automated content moderation during COVID-19. 
while AI is crucial to faster content processing at scale, filtering errors in these processes are well known uh, and well documented. Similarly, bigger ethical questions around the awareness of bias in these kinds of systems also is a factor that needs to be uh, properly thought through. It took an industry-led special arrangement uh, for library story times to go virtual. This is something US libraries argued was within the scope of the American broad fair use exception. But here in Australia, it required a set of negotiations between industry players in order to make that happen. So the industry agreement allowed online story time during the pandemic, uh, which was negotiated between the Australian Library and Information Association, the Australian Society of Authors, and the Australian Publishers Association, and this was later extended to schools through the efforts of the COAG National Copyright Unit. Without overshadowing the significance of these industry-led initiatives, generally speaking, licensing responses are piecemeal, slow, and require significant investment of time and resources to negotiate. The inconsistency of licensing can be seen in the update to the virtual storytime agreement that was published by Alia on the 22nd of September. There are seven different periods at which the arrangement will end across 23 children's picture book publishers. While an industry-led licensing or, or special arrangement uh, may be great in theory, as the uh, pandemic carried on, each publisher came in with a different response to when they wanted to see that arrangement end. And this creates an exceptionally complicated and difficult environment for cultural workers, uh, librarians and uh, similar types of workers, in order to determine if the type of book that they want to read in the virtual story time is currently still within the scope of this industry agreement or not. You need to look to a list like this and determine which publisher, or, or rather which book, which publisher, which time period can you rely on this agreement. Uh, and if you can't rely on it, then you need to look to get permissions directly from the publisher for that purpose. Uh, licensing is often not the most efficient way of trying to manage these kinds of things, especially in highly disruptive situations such as COVID-19. <clears throat> Exceptions that apply equally to all copyright materials and uses, including online uses, which have been drafted to ensure that they provide flexibility and which are protected from contractual override would go a long way to increasing the consistency and utility of these types of activities. Copyright reform, of course, tends to be a long process. Even recent law reform coming out of Canberra to modernise the Copyright Act has not addressed these underlying issues. For example, the Disability Access and Other Measures amendments, which most of which commenced in December 2017, introduced much needed flexibility for certain core on-site functions of libraries and archives, such as preservation, but failed to modernise things like remote supply of collections material, leaving the services most in demand under COVID-19 subject to the most outdated laws in the Copyright Act. Many of the copyright issues and cultural bodies uh, sorry, many of the copyright issues artists and cultural bodies have been experiencing during COVID-19 stem from Australia's outdated and inflexible copyright laws. Some of these issues could have been solved by the proposed copyright access reforms announced by the government in August this year. Some of these issues could have been solved by the proposed copyright access reforms announced by the government in August this year. Minister Fletcher announced updates to the libraries and archives and education exceptions introducing a limited liability scheme for the use of orphan works and a new fair dealing exception for non-commercial quotation, as well as updates to the government statutory licensing scheme. These changes will provide much needed flexibility for Australian creators, libraries, archives, schools, universities, vocational education and training providers and government agencies, resulting in better access outcomes for all Australians while protecting the rights of creators. As such, the ADA and the ALCC call on the government to recommend the introduction, uh, sorry, to expedite the introduction of the copyright access legislation as a priority. For more on these issues and other recent uh, and other issues related to the COVID-19 pandemic, you can view some of our recent submissions, such as the one to the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Communication and the Arts Inquiry to the Australian 
inquiry on Australia's creative and cultural industries and institutions, um, both of which you can access on the ADA and ALCC websites. Thank you.